I'm Bill Harris and welcome to Life Questions. We're glad you could join us today and you won't be disappointed for doing so. The issues that we're going to discuss this week happen to deal with, uh, number one, as the world comes out of the closet on the transgender issue, what does the church do when it comes out of the prayer, the prayer closet to meet them? A second issue that we'll take a look at, the concept of living with your loved one without benefit of marriage to determine whether or not you really should marry. And thirdly, we certainly hope there's enough time for this one, the issue of the highlights of light or the highlights of uh, this world and all the things, the problems that are going in on in this world, how they point out the real need for us to honor the Sabbath. And we hope we get to that today. We had promoted that on our last program. Um, first of all, I'd like to go back to the trans, transgender issue. Um, there's a lot of controversy, as you know, over this. Many churches have split over this. Um, so how do we address this as Christians? Number one, telling the world what the Bible says on this issue of same-sex relationships. How do we convey that without appearing to be, as the world would call us, bigots? And um, how do we love the entire world as God has given us to do, to love everybody? Who wants to go first on that one? Do I have to delegate? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, have to. I, would, I would just jump in and say that it, if you see transgender or, or identifying with some different uh, sexual orientation than you were born with is sin um, and we treat it like any other sin in the sense of you know we we should be as the church uh, building relationships with people Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors for the purpose of building relationship for the purpose mm -hmm. of introducing uh, connection so that they would want to walk with him and not necessarily so he would accept their lifestyle or the sins that they were engaged in, but, but that they would be exposed to the truth and have an opportunity to, uh, to come to faith. So for, for me, it's how do we approach it if we, if we make them as the, the lepers of our day and, and keep, mm -hmm. keep people out of the church, then we never have the opportunity to connect and to, to share Christ's love with it. I think that's Very important. Well the important well issue is, is the relationship. What kind of relationship do we have with, with people? And uh, I, I use the example of uh, Rosaria Butter, Butterfield, uh, who at one time was a uh, lesbian feminist who taught at, at, at Syracuse. And uh, at one point in her life, she had written a editorial in a newspaper uh, there in Syracuse, and a, a local pastor happened to see that and uh, rather than like maybe write a, a, another letter in response to her editorial piece, he and his wife, he was a pastor, he invited Rosaria into his home mm -hmm. for dinner. And uh, all he did was basically love on, love on her, her, her this, this pastor and his, his wife. So the and love of Christ. That's what love the, of Christ. Sure. I mean, he didn't even invite her to church, although eventually he had like a small group Bible study in his home. And eventually Rosaria is thinking, this will be great research for me. I can <laughs> see what, you know, this, this, this church who would condemn my lifestyle and I'd have more information. Mm -hmm. And eventually it ended up that Rosaria came to know Jesus. Now, as, as you were saying, we're not, we're not going to change a person. It's Jesus who's going to change a person. Absolutely. So, you know, how, how do we love people who are making what we would call from Scripture a sinful choice? Mm -hmm. And for, for Rosaria, it was this pastor and his wife opening up their home to her, feeding her dinner, allowing her to interact. Wasn't a high pressure like go to church and, mm -hmm. and all that. It wasn't that, but it was, she saw in that aspect of Jesus yeah. and it changed her. And she said something that very significant. She, she ended up writing a book, which has come out recently, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And she talks about how we can influence mm -hmm. people around us by simply opening our homes to people to come into, mm -hmm. which is radical in itself. I mean, but it is biblical. Yeah, but we are yeah, to practice yeah. hospitality. But she said something really, really key because, because I've heard this basically all my, my Christian life is, is you... 
you hate the sinner and you love or you hate the sin, hate the and sin. you love the, the sinner. sinner. Yeah, you're going to say, wow. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, all right, but we've heard that, right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and she but said, some but, churches get but, it the other way. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> but, but anyway, she said, a lot of times, though, that the person is so identified with the sin, it's like, it, it's, still, it's still the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So she says, hate the sin and hate your sin more. Hmm. Uh -huh. Oh, so now it becomes more of a level, yeah, like I'm not yeah. categorizing the sin. Well, that's a uh -huh. worse sin than mm -hmm. the sin that I commit. She levels it out and mm -hmm. says, we both, we, we both need Jesus. Well, like when, when the, in, in the case where the, the woman that had been caught in the act of adultery comes before Christ and Christ turned to those who were commanding that he stone her and said mm -hmm. that he who was without sin cast the first stone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much Everybody so. walked away yeah. at that point. I, I think the, the one difference with this than maybe other issues is that there's a, a push, and this is where the church struggles, there's a, there's a push to make this particular um, sin culturally acceptable, mm -hmm. to not see it yeah. as sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, people, Big uh, push. people yeah. who, who are in that lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know, the LGBTQ mm -hmm. lifestyle, do not see it as sin. Right. They don't yeah. want it labeled as such. And, and that's where I think the church is really wrestling mm -hmm. because there's so many people in our congregations that have family members mm -hmm. or who wrestle mm -hmm. uh, with questions of their own mm -hmm. identity. Mm -hmm. And, and they, we don't like hearing you know, that this isn't acceptable. We don't want to be corrected. Mm -hmm. and, and they're wrestling very internally mm -hmm. with a deep love for their family, mm -hmm. but they're making choices that uh, they don't like. And so do we then accept this lifestyle as normative or or and so that my loved one gets a pass or do you know and i think mm -hmm. that's that's the question but you had a great scripture uh, that kind of well, helped us <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. I, was, I was gonna say going along with you say i have a saying that says a sin is a sin until my children do it mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. And once our children do it, then we, we somehow we have to justify it or we have to make it so it's not a sin because we, we, we're wrestling with this mm -hmm. eternal thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a, a <laughs> I've done many hats in my life, uh, but I was also the chaplain of the Hancock County um, uh, Jail for 12 years. And you'd get a lot of uh, lesbians and homosexuals and uh, transgenders and all those would go in there. And I remember one uh, lesbian in particular looked at me and she goes, so what does the Bible say about this? How did you answer that? <laughs> I said, well, I would like you to read Romans chapter 1 and you tell me what it says. In other words, I put it back on her. I had her read the scriptures instead of me just saying, hey, that's a sin because we would be shut off. Yeah. We'd oh, be yeah. done yeah. at that yeah. point. And uh, so you read Romans chapter 1 and notice I said I went into Romans. Mm -hmm. I went in the New Testament, not in the mm -hmm. Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Because if you use the Old Testament scriptures, then they have every right to use all the Old Testament law on you. So you're wearing two, two different types of, cl of uh, cloth, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I only use the, it's the New Testament. Okay, getting back to what you said. Um, a life-changing scripture passage that I use, and every once in a while as a pastor, you get hit with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. And this is one here, and it's uh, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, it's, you know, it's about a man who's having you know, sex with his father's wife and all that weird stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 says, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are we not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked amongst you. There's a, there's a lot. There. <laughs> but we have a tendency to look at the outside of the church while not cleaning up our own church. It's mm -hmm. easier to point our fingers at, at the LGBTQ, how dare you, uh, while we got gossip going on in our, inside of our church. Mm -hmm. God says, clean it up inside, then you'll have... They're condemned already, according to scriptures. Let me so, ask you this, and that's a major point because... When you say they are condemned already, that's backed up in John, after John 3.16, the verse that's called the key yeah. to the Bible. Yeah. 
verse 17 all the way down to 21 begins to say the same thing that how the world is already condemned. Already condemned. Yeah. We must go to that world that is already condemned to let them know that that, that sin has terrible effects mm -hmm. and that we and we can't pick out certain sins, mm -hmm. but this is among them. And certainly we, we see that if children are growing up in society where there are two moms mm -hmm. or two dads, it skews the thinking of life about that child coming up. And, and there are other, other consequences as well. How do we convey these things and convince them that yes, the Lord loves you right where you are in your sin. And he got down in your mess and your sin and he wallowed in that mm -hmm. to die for you. But when you come to him, he will change you because mm -hmm. we don't want change. People don't want, even Christians don't want change. No. So Bill, how do we convey all yeah. that? But Bill, I think that's the point yeah. is introducing people to Jesus yeah. and letting him change them. Yeah. Yeah. I, had a, I had a wise old uh, grandmother in the church tell me one time, uh, Pastor, you need to recognize that you're not somebody's personal Holy Spirit. Hmm. That that mm -hmm. that I and I, that was very helpful for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to put my finger on issues that the Holy Spirit wasn't messing yeah. around with. And yeah. I'm so grateful that when I came to Jesus, mm -hmm. He didn't show me all of my sin at once. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. I, I mean, are, uh -huh. that that He as as you grow then the Lord reveals things that you need to change that, and you grow in Christ likeness and holiness. So I think the first step is introducing people to Jesus, yes. yeah. letting them know about yes. the sacrifice yeah. he paid, not naming necessarily all their sins unless that's an issue they want to discuss. And a, if they're in the word and they're growing, and this is for anybody, the, the Lord will bring conviction. The yes, Lord will. will point it out. And if they're open to, people speaking into their life, it's, it's, that transformation will happen. Another well, way I heard that put is that the Lord called us to catch the fish, not to clean the fish. Mm -hmm. That's his business. Yeah. <laughs> That's another way I heard that. Yeah. Uh, but what do we do now when laws are being changed that yeah. go against the foundations of Christianity to favor those with the ultimate lifestyle? And, 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 and attempts to pressure us to conform to that. In many ways, then, the scriptures should make, be more relevant to the Christian. Paul didn't write into a culture that, I mean, he's, he didn't write into a culture that was, uh, you know, uh, one nation under God, the Yahweh, the king, you know, the king on high. It, in many ways, I see Christians panicking of, well, culture's changing. It's like, well, good, the Bible might actually start being more of a service to you mm -hmm. because uh, the scriptures prepare <laughs> yeah. you for when your neighbor hates you for loving the Lord. The scriptures yeah. prepare you mm -hmm. for when you might be crucified upside down. Mm -hmm. The scriptures like prepare you for when the Sanhedrin calls you in and, and questions you about these mm -hmm. things. And so in many ways, um, a little persecution might go a long way to having people actually determine what, what they actually believe mm -hmm. and what they actually hold true, but also in some ways might cause the scriptures to come alive in a way that, you know, when Paul's writing Philippians and, and is in chains for Christ and our brothers and sisters around the world, say in, in China in the underground church, quite literally know what it means to be in chains for Christ. Mm -hmm. And as pastors, when we preach on Philippians, we're like, uh, that time your neighbor was rude to you. Yeah. 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 And, and that's the best we can do know, to try and contextualize yeah. Philippians when our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world are like, well, I'm reading this in chains. Paul was in chains. Mm -hmm. Not much has changed. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's even mm -hmm. a, a, a pressure release for Christians of our faith has been rejected by governments. Our faith has been accepted by governments. Christ is on high over all government. Mm -hmm. So as crazy. yeah, so as we as Christians mm -hmm. come to that, um, we need not fear. The, the Lord has got the you know I, I I laugh with my church. The most basic theology we teach kids, He's got the whole world in His hands. Mm -hmm. We can believe that. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. On that note, we need to pause and take a break. Yeah, that's very well said. When we come back, however, we want to take a look at the issue that is quite prominent in society today, and that is, I think that I ought to live with my lover before I marry them, just to determine whether or not we should, in fact, get married. Is there validity in that concept? We'll deal with that and more right after this. 
don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. And we are back and welcome you. Now, we want to continue our discussion, but uh, going down another track at, at this point, this concept has been around for a long time. People who feel that, you know, there have been so many people that have gotten divorces who had they known the person they married was the way they were, they wouldn't have married them in the first place. So why not live together without benefit of marriage first and then if we like one another, we'll go down to the JP, the Justice <laughs> of Peace, and go ahead and get married. Uh, how say you on this, gentlemen? Is there validity in there? Well, you, you're going to say you want the uh, shortened version or the long version? Because God said no. It's that simple. He said don't do it. Uh, and, and you want scripture? I got it all here because I was all ready for this. But no, don't do it. And it does not work. I... Uh, I, I don't know how, do how know to explain. Well, what do you, you get see? all these young Please. girls coming in, and I'm going to get married, and we've been living together, and life is great. I love him so much. And then you hit them with the reality that you now have five times more chance of getting divorced than somebody who didn't live together before marriage. Oh, that's not going to happen to us. We love each other. Oh, really? You would get on an airplane that has an 88% chance of going out of the sky? But it's not going to happen to us. I said, I, and there's couples, I literally looked at them, I said, you got three to five years and you're going to get divorced. And they come to me three years later and say, I wish I would have listened to you. Mm -hmm. God says no. If you're a Christian, God says no, don't do it. Now, you, you want the scriptures? Yeah, Here it is. Yeah, yeah. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality. Oh, but we're not having sex. You just lied. <laughs> <laughs> Impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, and I can go on with this. Uh, mm -hmm. First Kings, First Timothy chapter 4. Uh, now the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times some will depart from the faith, even though they say they are in the faith, but you're not living the faith, uh, giving heed to seducing spirits. Notice what it says, seducing spirits, lying spirits. If I live together before I get married, then I'll... That, it is a better chance of getting married. That is a lie. Mm -hmm. um, you notice I'm passionate about it because I, I, yeah. I deal with yeah. it so yeah. much. It's so frustrating because these, usually young girls, because they think it's a way to get, get them in and we're going to get married, he just wants the milk and cookies. Yeah. And, and then yeah. when you finally yeah. press him, a lot of times he's out the door because he really didn't want to get married because he just wanted... The milk and the cookies. He won the milk and cookies. That's the what, only way to put it. What, what's the what's the root of that whole thing? Is probably the root of all kinds of sin. Is that we just don't trust right. God. Mm -hmm. We we think that there's a better way. You mm -hmm. know, we think well, I've got a better way to solve this problem, or I I can figure out my own life. And what God says here doesn't, uh, doesn't apply to me. I know better, which is essentially the root of every sin, right? The center of every sin is I. I, I know best. I can do it my <laughs> way. I, yeah. I want to yeah. do what I want to do. But statistically, even biblically, statistically, according to uh, Journal of uh, Marriage and Family, back just in October of 18, 42% uh, of first marriages fail, 60% of second marriages, 73% of third marriages, and the rates for people who've lived together is higher than that and it extends for decades after. The first year, the marriage rate is a little bit less uh, or the divorce rate is a little bit less mm -hmm. because you've kind of worked through all, but from the second year on, the, the rate exceeds mm -hmm. far above uh, what typical divorce is. So even from a statistical perspective, even if they're not Christian, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to throw this out here, and I, I think it's, you know, we're, we're talking about this word sin, and I think part of the issue, and all, uh, everything that we're talking about here is our culture doesn't recognize sin. It doesn't even have a definition for sin. It doesn't know what sin is. We, we do, 
as pastors, we understand sin. And sin is definitely, it's, it, it, Scripture teaches it, Jesus taught it, it exists. But think about our culture in general. It's basically, I'm the master of my own life. I can do what I want to do. No one has the right to tell me to do anything else. We live in a hyper-individualistic society that doesn't even recognize sin. We, our, we, we always hear, follow your own dreams, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Follow your own dreams. Let me tell you, no, don't follow your own dreams. Follow what the Lord has given to us. This, he has our best interests at heart, mm -hmm. but people don't believe it. They think, I'm going to follow my own heart's desire. Mm -hmm. and, and then that what happens is they, they end up following their own heart's desire, and they experience brokenness and pain. Well, why is that? Because that's sin, and that's what sin does. It breaks us. And then they blame God for it. And then they blame <laughs> God, how yeah. did you do this? Yeah. No, you made that decision. You made no. the decision. Well, I think even for me, I always approach it from a different thing. If God says no to going back to marriage is not being a roommate. Um, so um, marriage is a covenant. Mm -hmm. I've only made two covenants, and I hope to only make two. One between the Lord my God and my wife. Mm -hmm. That if you're talking about a living situation, you, you're talking about a roommate. And the second you start thinking about marriage as a roommate situation, mm -hmm. I had good roommates. I have bad roommates. <laughs> we've all had good. I mean, in college, we had roommates that cleaned up after themselves. Roommates they didn't. We had. We've been the bad roommate. We've you know that paid our bills on time that if you start looking at your marriage as, well, I gotta check out my roommate situation versus, I mean, my wife and I didn't live together before we were married. And we figured out the roommate stuff based off of our covenant to one another. Mm -hmm. The roommate and how we loved one another and who's gonna pay the bills and you know who's gonna mm -hmm. take out the trash and who's gonna do those things and where are we gonna keep the bread and my family put the bread in the freezer and your, you know, all that's the roommate stuff. Mm -hmm. That flowed out of covenant. And, and if we get that right, you know, if we get the covenant right, mm -hmm. then when there's annoyances as roommates, there's going to be a lot more, well, I, I was annoyed with roommates, but, and I could leave my roommate, but I made a covenant with you. Mm -hmm. And I actually meant that covenant. Mm -hmm. And so I can't, if we have to shift couples thinking of, oh, it's just a, it's a roommate agreement. You know, we signed the lease together <laughs> yeah. versus, yeah. no, you've, you've sworn before God and man, mm -hmm. or justice of the peace. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, and so that covenant is what we then live out of, which all of a sudden makes all the little silly roommate stuff seem kind of silly because you've actually agreed to hold your loved one's hand till death do you part. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. where they, how they make sandwiches and the way they cook dinner, that seems and kind of silly. in the freezer, wow, I just can't get my mind around that. Yeah. <laughs> I've never done that. It, that. That's one of the arguments I've heard of people. Yeah. That we okay. put bread in the bread, bread box, we put bread in the fridge, we put, you know, the little bit stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that's the biggest sin. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, and just going real quickly, is why is the divorce rate so high? And I, I'll be honest, I've been pondering, because let's be honest, it makes sense to live together. Let's, let's find out what, what they're like. Logically speaking. Yeah. Logically yeah. speaking, but biblically we know it's wrong. Why is it? And the only thing I've been able to come up with is with this. When you are so apt to compromise before the covenant, then why would you, why would you keep the covenant oh, after yeah. you make it? Yeah, that's... that's the only thing I can figure because you compromise before and they're probably going to compromise You're afterwards. You're definitely more likely. Yeah. Yeah. More likely to, yeah. Well, going along with what um, Craig was saying, is it's uh, this idea of convenience. Mm -hmm. As long as, whether it be a roommate situation or whatever, if it's, a, if it's an issue of convenience, uh, well, it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. we, we don't have to yeah. split the, the rent, uh, you know, whatever. Well, if my relationship is a matter of convenience, when it's not convenient anymore, mm -hmm. when it ceases to be fun, mm -hmm. when I go through a difficult time, um, when, my, when the person wrongs me or mm -hmm. definitely sin, well, if, if I'm in a covenant, I've committed to love them, to walk mm -hmm. through it, to see it through. Mm -hmm. if, if, I've, if, I'm, if it's just a matter of convenience, mm -hmm. I'll just check out and go someplace else. Yeah. 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 Let's turn the subject because we did promise our viewers we were going to try to take some time to get to the real need to honor the Sabbath. <laughs> I think you have. Switching you, gears. <laughs> really switching gears. Uh, you have a beautiful concept about that and why God gave us the Sabbath. Could you just explain that? Yeah, I just see people running around ragged. 
uh, if, and, and this is Christian, non-Christian uh, pastors, mm -hmm. burnout, that people are burned out, they're running around. And uh, what I've seen culture start to do is take the idea of Sabbath and they've rewrapped it with this secular idea called self-care. And, and the idea that uh, people are recognizing if we don't slow down, we're gonna burn out. Mm -hmm. If we don't take time for our families, we're gonna lose connection with our kids. If we don't take time with our spouses, we're gonna lose connection with our spouses. If we don't take time to attend worship, that maybe our kids will perceive that as worship of the Lord is not all that important. Yeah. Um, and so God gave the church this gift of Sabbath of rest and some of us have been taught well sabbath means you can only read the bible and go to church and that's it and anything else would be a sin on sabbath what i've what i've looked at sabbath is as a holy day and a holiday hmm. that it's both mm -hmm. that it is indeed for the house of god to come together and worship to fellowship for a family to come together to worship to fellowship to get right all these things we're talking about so much of it comes back as we're not right with god that we confess our own sins, bring them to the cross, that we reestablish relationship. And then out of that holiness, mm -hmm. we can then take a break into rest. And I just think I see so many families that they're run, I always joke that they're run by their seven-year-old soccer schedule, <laughs> that they're run by their 10-year-old's travel baseball team or show choir schedule, that they're letting their children dictate the pace of their home mm -hmm. and they never break. Mm -hmm. And because they never break, they break. Yes. And, and it's just something that, any of the other Ten Commandments, we would all sit up here and say, honor the Lord your God. Don't uh, have an affair with your neighbor's wife. Don't steal your neighbor's donkey or car. <laughs> but when it comes to Sabbath, we go, well, if you get a chance, maybe take a break. When did that one become the one that's mushy mm -hmm. for Christians? Mm -hmm. We put the Ten Commandments in all our churches and we talk about these things. Why did Sabbath become the one? God put it on the same par as murder. Do not murder. Yeah. To break. Why have we then as a, well, maybe if I get a chance. Yeah. I, I wish you would be more passionate about that issue. <laughs> <laughs> take a nap. God wants you to take a nap. <laughs> Gentlemen, how, how do you respond to this? I go with what you said. What's that? <laughs> what I say. <laughs> well, what we said about the living good and everything oh, else. The, yeah. the, the word sin has I in it. Yeah. yeah. And we still want to be in control of our yeah. lives. Yeah. Instead of saying, okay, God, I'm going to back off and, mm -hmm. and just rest a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we're killing ourselves. Oh, we are literally yeah. killing ourselves and, uh, because we're not resting. I think Jesus said, you know, uh, this man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Yes. Yes. That it was a, a pattern yeah. and a rhythm of life that he tried to instill from creation, from creation. for us. I think where yeah. it gets muddled sometimes is we read those passages of Scripture where the, the uh, Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, mm. were critical of Jesus' healing on the Sabbath. Mm. And, and we kind of take that as, well, Jesus worked, or mm. you know, we take that as Jesus was saying that the Sabbath wasn't important. Mm. What he was saying is, all these man-made rules that we bind ourselves up with aren't good. Thank you very much. We're going to have to end it there. Wow. Really appreciate your fine, fine input in today's program. All right. It's all the time we have. We'll be back again next week at the same time. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com. <laughs>